Uh, this woman, go back for just a second. Emma? Emma Gonzalez, amazing. Yeah. That, yeah. that yeah. six yeah. minutes of silence that she did mm -hmm. was just so, so powerful. Mm -hmm. So powerful. Yeah. Yeah, and this guy, we'll be seeing him in some office somewhere mm -hmm. in the future. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, wow. I'm not going to stand for six and a half minutes, but um, I just want to be sensitive to the fact that people have different opinions and that we're not a monolith in how we believe on these different things, but we can all agree on the principles, the principles of safety, the principles of uh, an environment for our children, that it supports education, uh, the principle of measured conversation and speech, speaking together in union uh, toward a common goal. And those common goals are around principles. And if we can have conversations, then we can find a way to get to that common goal principle that is productive and uh, compassionate and healthy uh, and effective. But it takes coming from here and here and going to there. Uh, we're talking about that in our, in our Mystical Foundations class this week. We're talking about the third force, something called the third force, and the sweetness of adversity. And it certainly was the adversity of this situation that has caused the sweetness of having thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people gather in hundreds of cities, not just across the nation, but around the world, because what happens in America matters to the entire world. Talking about this week, this DIY mind cleansing, the do-it-yourself mind cleansing, it begins with what I'm talking about. It begins with that very same conversation. It begins with how we look at our perceptions of what is going on in life. There's a, a Zen quote <laughs> that I love that says, time is like a mirror standing. Time is like a mirror standing. Take care to wipe it all the time. That mirror is constantly reflecting back to us. Life is constantly reflecting back to us what's happening right up here, what our perceptions are. I'm thinking about the farmer who's sitting on his front porch with his grandson on a main road leading into town. And he's been having a conversation with his grandson, not unlike what I just started with, you know, speaking from integrity, telling the truth whenever you can. And a person stops by the farm house, you know, in the country, you can just wave, and everybody waves, you know, so the guy drives by, and he waves, so the guy stops, and the man says, uh, I'm getting ready to travel into this town here, and I'm just wondering, what are the people like in that town? And the farmer says, what were the people like in the town where you came from? Oh, they were just terrible. They were grumps. I didn't get along with anybody. I, that's why I left. He says, ah, you shall meet them here. <laughs> A few minutes later, a woman drives by. She waves, he waves, she stops. You know, I'm looking for a new place to live. I was thinking about moving to this town down the road. What, do you, what is that town like? She says, what was the town like where you left? Oh, it was beautiful. I loved it. The people threw me a party when I left. I just felt the call to go somewhere else. I love people, and, 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 and it just seems like uh, this might be a nice place to go. What's the town like? Do you think I'll like the people there? You shall meet the people there that you have met in the town you left. Because it's about perception. It's about this time standing like a mirror, you see. And what we have is the opportunity to do it ourselves, to cleanse that mirror, to wipe it clean on a regular basis. It's all about perception. Oh, God. Yeah, clean those glasses. <laughs> Start right there with your glasses. What a great metaphor for cleaning the lens. Because life, is, life, that mirror that I'm talking about, that, that life is, it's constantly reflecting back our joy and our suffering. If we see good in our lives, we will see good reflected back. If we see bad, we will see bad reflected back. It just works that way. My favorite story of that is driving traffic on the 405. If you leave a, the four or five hour freeway, right? If you leave a little bit late, all right? 
and you and you haven't checked your car lately, and the the tires are kind of kind of bald, and 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 you still got an eight track tape player in the car, you know, and the air conditioner's not working, and it's July. You are miserable driving in that traffic, and here's a guy right next to you who does maintain his car, who's listening on Sirius Radio, and he left on time. You're in hell, he's in heaven, and you're both stuck in traffic. It's all about perception. The choices that we make. <laughs> I think I've told this story before, but I'm going to tell it again because I just like it so much, about the guy who's uh, taking care of his friend's dog. And, the, and, the, and he says, okay, I want you to take care of my dog, but when you're doing it, when you walk the dog, you must play fetch with the dog. You, uh, you know the story? At the beach. You must play fetch with the dog. So he takes the dog down to the lake to play fetch. And so he's throwing the stick, and, and he's a little nervous because, you know, it's not his dog, and he, he's taking it off leash so he can do fetch. So he just kind of tosses the stick the first time. The dog runs over, gets it, and brings it right back. He says, oh, this, this is good. He's, he's obeying. Okay. So he throws it a little bit farther the next time. The dog runs, and he gets it back. Now this next time, he's like, this is really fun. I'm having fun. He heaves the stick, and it gets caught in the wind, and it drifts over and falls into the lake. And the dog takes off, boom, and he runs to the end of the water, and he gets onto the water, and he just keeps on running right on top of the water and gets a stick and comes back. The guy's like, what? <laughs> so he tries, I'm, this time I'm going to do it on purpose. So he on purpose throws it out into the lake, and the dog, sure enough, he just takes off and runs right across the water and runs on back. This is amazing. And he sees a guy down the road. He says, come here, check this out. Look at this. And he throws the stick, and the dog does the same thing, and he comes back, and he says to the guy, what do you think of that? The guy says, that dog can't swim. <laughs> you see? Perception. Perception is a crazy thing. But we have the power to change our perceptions of things. William Blake, great line. If the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is, infinite. If the doorway of our perception were cleansed. But the problem is, it's not. It's closed off. It's narrow. It's like the guy who eats bad food all the time and he goes to the cardiologist and the guy says, sorry, but uh, your heart is because your veins and your arteries are clogged. Our perception gets that same way. It gets clogged. It gets narrowed down. We must constantly remind ourselves that there is a wider view of life. We live in an infinite universe, and if we can open ourselves to the infinity that God gives us the opportunity to experience, we have a wider view. That's what those kids were talking about. Take a wider view of things. We're not saying take away anything from somebody. We're just saying have a bigger idea of how we can all get what we want. Open ourselves up. But you see, we're closed down by our habits and our beliefs and our narrow-mindedness, by the agreements that we make in life. You know, we got, we could cure cancer just like that if we wanted to, but we haven't agreed to. What we've agreed to instead is to spend money to build a new football stadium for some team. Now, I love football. But, you know, have you seen the new, you should see this new stadium. My brother lives in, in Minneapolis. They got this brand, oh, the Super Bowl was there. You saw it. They got this new stadium up there in Minneapolis. It's absolutely gorgeous. And in the shadow of that stadium, they have thousands of homeless people. Can you imagine being homeless in Minnesota? Jeez, that's tough, you know? We could cure all these things. But we have decided by our agreements to not open our doors of perception to the opportunities that are before us. We stay closed down. Now, fortunately, our brain comes to the rescue of the situations like this. And unfortunately, at the same time, because we have these two astonishing activities that take place in the brain. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. The two are forgetting and remembering. <laughs> They're wonderful. They really are. Because without forgetting, life would quickly stand still. Because our brain just could not handle all the stuff that takes place if we were constantly remembering everything, you see. So it's something that we have to do. Forgetting allows us to move the past into the past. It frees up space, gives more space for the future to take place. So forgetting has, a, has its, own, its own way of being. Ooh, back to the Bible. Fun words, Philippians, <laughs> Thessalonians, they got some crazy people in the Middle East, man. I love those names. 
You know, I mean, what you, you know, the Angelinos. I mean, it's nice, but Philippians, that's fun. <laughs> okay. One thing I do, this is, this is Paul speaking, who wrote the letters. To, he wrote all these epistles, Paul. He was just, what an amazing character Paul was. I mean, you know, think about this guy. Well, it's, it's, it's Palm Sunday. I can go a little bit Christian on us. Okay, so here you got this guy, Paul, right? And he's running around as Saul, and he's a Pharisee, right? So he's one of the guys that just does not like what's going on, and he wants you to be right down the line. And so when the followers of the way, which is what they call the folks that follow Jesus around, when the followers of the way were starting to show up, he was thinking, mm -mm -mm, you can't be doing this kind of stuff. And then he had this boom moment where he realized, Maybe they are making kind of sense. And he had this shift, and so Saul became Paul. And then he went around writing letters about the value, the, value, the value of this way teaching. And during it, he says to one of these letters, he writes this, one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. That's what he does. He recognizes that he's doing that, you see. The forgetting, hmm. I'm going to have to close this down and open it up so I can remember. No, I don't want to remember. I want it to tell me. There we go. So now the forgetting thing, of course, I forgot that because it's a natural process. <laughs> it happens. It's just like the blood circulating. I mean, like yesterday. The things that happened yesterday, some of, them, some of them are very significant that we will remember, and some of them aren't that important. I mean, you know, what you had for lunch, or did you turn left, or did you turn right? Some of the things, they just don't, they just don't work for us. Uh, the weather, we'll, we'll forget, the w yeah, it's beautiful weather, but a month from now, we'll forget. I was up in the, in the canyon in, in Sunland, and it was, got cloudy and cold all of a sudden, while back down in Studio City, it was absolutely bright and sunny. Then I came over here in Simi Valley, and it was kind of in between. Now, three weeks from now, I will not even remember that, because it's just not important. But I probably, will remember that March yesterday and in the six and a half minutes, that, that, that is, that's touched me, you see? So forgetting is a very natural thing and it allows us to give that space as I was talking about before. And, and it works against some of the, the deeper things in life. Like when a hurt is really too painful, it's kind of nice that we have this thing that where we can forget. Or when people do things for us and the sense of gratitude becomes so burdensome that we can't get over, it was just so wonderful what they did. You know, you said thank you, okay, it's enough, stop, right? But it, so sometimes we, f we forget those things. Or oh, here's one that's so wonderful to forget, past lovers. <laughs> but you know what? Here's one of the reasons why it's so wonderful to forget them. <laughs> In the, <laughs> she's not here. <laughs> she's watching at home. This is nutty. This is fine. This is public stuff. Uh, no, but the, but here's what comes to me. Sometimes, sometimes in the process of moving through relationships, these past relationships are identifying parts of our shadow that we're just not ready to deal with. You know. Because when it really comes down to it, if we commit to a relationship, we can work through anything. But sometimes we're not ready to make that commitment. Sometimes they're pointing stuff out to us that we're just not ready to see right now. So we forget about it until it shows up at a time in our life when we're ready to work through it, you see. And hate, hating is one of those things that it's so wonderful that we can forget. Because if you don't forget the intensity of a feeling that makes you want to hate, it becomes so disruptive that it stagnates your life and you can't move forward, you can't move it to compassion. So some of this forgetting, and oh my goodness, guilt, it can sting, it can hurt, it can drive you into shame and put you into that darkness. So forgetting the things that make us guilty, you know? Wow, <coughs> right? Um, Paul Tillich, it's a wonderful book called The Eternal Now. It's been on my shelf for like, five years and suddenly I picked it up and I realized it was written in 1957 and my birthday's next week I thought this is pretty cool I read a book that was written the year I was born hmm. Easter how about that a formless rushing ahead a formless rushing ahead indiscriminate severing of the roots of the past results in emptiness a lack of presence and thus a lack of future now that's powerful stuff right there. Because what he's actually saying here is that yes, that natural process of forgetting, the stuff of the weather, what we had for lunch, left turn, right turn, all that kind of stuff, yeah, 
Cool. Forget that. But if we just indiscriminately forget things, then the root of our growth is cut off. We must remember certain things. And it's not about repressing certain things, because if we repress something, we fall. We put ourselves into failure mode by repressing, because you see, it's not going to liberate us what we repress. What we've actually done, if we repress a memory, as opposed to forget, if we repress a memory, we've just stuffed it down, put it in a tomb, and covered it over for it to later come back as a nasty pimple. <laughs> there was a guy who used to go to this, this church where they did uh, open confessional. Open, they call it testimony. And uh, the preacher would, would speak to the moment of testimony, and it was a time when they would, like, like a call to prayer. And this gentleman would say, every time he would say, Lord, please clear the cobwebs that keep me from a presence and a knowing of thou. Let, let thee be free so I can experience thou by taking away the cobwebs. And every week he would say the same thing. And one week he began to say this thing, and some guy from the back of the room screamed out, Just kill the spider! <laughs> that was powerful stuff right there. That's what we do in the science of mind. See, we go down and we dig deep to find the hidden belief. Not, we don't just, rep we don't repress stuff. I mean, we do repress stuff, come on, we're human. But once we realize that we have repressed something, we use our teaching to dig down into that hidden belief, find out what the hidden belief is, unroot that hidden belief, and by unrooting it, we have a fullness of life. We feel the presence of spirit, and then we move forward into a beautiful future. We're in the business of killing spiders. See, and that's what this DIY mind cleansing is all about. It's about cleansing the doorway of perception, cleansing the way we think about life, digging down and getting rid of the spiders. Okay, maybe not kill them. Maybe use that neat little thing that you've seen that on Facebook or anybody. You know, it's like this net, and you go and you grab it, the spider with a net, and then you can take it outside and shake it free. That's very cool. Right, because I mean, I don't want to necessarily kill spiders. They they do good stuff. I'm not not against spiders, but I'm against the cobwebs of our mind that hold us and limit us and limit our ability to move forward in life. You see, so metaphorically, yes, kill the spider, DIY your mind, cleanse it. You see, and remember that. Remember to remember, the remembering part, the other side of forgetting, is so wonderful. This goes back to Paul Tillich. Something of the past remains alive in the present so that there is ground from which to grow into the future. Those things that we have held into our memory, those, those deeper ones that I talked about, the ones around ex-loves and around hate and, and around uh, shame and guilt and, and that, that we sort of hold down, those, those, are, those are very valuable <coughs> memories. Those are very valuable memories. They sometimes get put on the sideline for a minute, and then when we're ready, we can remember them and bring them back and use what's new and present in our lives to move through those experiences. See, because what's significant does remain it remains in our holding pattern. It remains in our, in our disk drive. But as we go moving forward, our mental disk drive, but as we go to move forward, as we go to defrag our brains, we get to this place where what's significant is available to us to breed wisdom. We actually get wisdom from this. We get perspective. We start to move into the space of possibility. See, so forgetting and remembering are extremely necessary to the process of living a life of wholeness. The two extremes only exist as extremes because they're on a continuum. And so when you put the two extremes together and you draw a line between the two and put a circle around them, then you're living in the wholeness of life itself. So what is bad and what is good are together to make life better. And we must mine that stuff. We must push through the cobwebs, do the deep weeding, and recognize, as Ernest Holmes says, if God is all there is, then past, present, and future, time, experience, and form, if they exist at all, they must exist as some part of truth. And what is truth? Truth is God itself. Truth is life itself. With God being all there is, all that we've had in our past, brought into our present and looked at cleanly with the widest view possible, thinking about curiosity, asking questions, coming to it with the mind of a child. And we know when children, you know, you know the children we're talking about, they get to that why, 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 tell me more stage. 
you know? What's that, four? Yeah, three to five, you know? If you can get to that place with your past while you bring it back into your present moment, because, you know, the past, yeah, it, we call it the past, but we're recognizing it now, so it's coming to the present moment. So now we're taking a look at it. We're being curious about it. Did it serve us? What does it take us forward to? Not afraid of it right? Jump into it. And then we move into our future. Because you see, that whole experience is happening in life itself. It's a God experience. And we are the emanations of God. We're here to figure this stuff out. And this is a wonderful way that we get to do it. Forgetting and remembering are the way that we cleanse our mind. They bring us that space for growth. They open us up to novelty and to expansion. As I said, it's the, it's old school. It's the mental defrag. It's it's the, it's the launch the cleaner. You know, you hit the button on your computer says launch the cleaner now. Yeah, launch the cleaner now. Remember, dig back a little bit. And there's another aspect that I think is really beautiful about forgetting and remembering. Sometimes we forget, in spite of remembering. We remember an event, something someone's done to us, something someone has said that landed funny, that landed in the heart space in an awkward way, right? And we decide to forget it, but there's still a memory of it. But there's a memory of it that has no attachment. That space right there, that's forgiveness. Part of forgetting, in spite of remembering, is about forgiveness. <coughs> And I think the biggest thing that we could forgive, it's in the Lord's Prayer, our own trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. It starts with forgive us of our own trespasses, our own mistakes, the things that we have stuffed back into that part of the memory that we hold on to that still have the sting. If we can process those areas, move through those areas and grow into our own forgiveness of ourselves. We become more available to life itself, more available to us, more available to the future, more productive human beings. And that's really what it's all about, you know? We're in a collaborative relational universe. I talk about this a lot, but it's really the most important aspect of where we are today. We've done so much on our own about ourselves. It's now time to use that work for ourselves for the benefit of everyone else. That's our mission, that's our vision statement that we talk about. Back to Paul Tillich for a minute. He says, it is infinitely important that we not forget ourselves. This individual being, this individual being not to be recreated, unique, eternally precious, and delivered into our hands. What a sweet responsibility we have for ourselves. We are this individualized expression of the divine. There will not be another you. You are youer than you. There will be no more you. This is it. You are that you, unique and eternally precious, living in, in, in a space of time and place that never goes away. We may forget the, the uh, experience of, of going to Magic Mountain or uh, doing a wedding or seeing a child born, but but there's this eternality that exists no matter what. There's love, there's beauty, there's harmony, there's peace, there's joy. And all those experiences just bring us those qualities, those God qualities. That's what's been delivered into our hands through us. So it's our responsibility as an expression of the divine to live this, this experience as fully as we possibly can by forgetting what really has no significance, the little things in life, by storing away some things to be worked on when the time is right, calling them up through our memory, forgetting that stuff, the sting about this so we can move into forgiveness. In the process, we cleanse the doorways of perception. We do our own thing. Do it yourself, mind cleansing. It's available to each and every one of us, and I offer you the opportunity to do it as frequently as you like. And so it is. So, affirmation time. Are you ready? Yes. All right. 
I take conscious control of my thoughts, cleansing the doors of perception. I see only good and experience only blessings. Mm -hmm. ah. Thank you, Betsy. This ought to be entertaining. Is it? John's on. John, John. But anyway, it's already done. It's already turned around all crooked and backwards and everything. Lovely. It's about cleansing. I'm cleansed. I have no, I have, I'm forgetting that. <laughs> all right. It's our time for healing prayer. <laughs> Time to love the world. It was really interesting to watch people loving the world. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's a volleyball. You want to hit it. I get it. But think about the gentleness that it takes to really love the world. The gentleness that it takes to love each and every person in our lives. And the experience of seeing someone moving through something that they maybe need to forget or something that they need to remember about themselves. And that's what the power of prayer does for us. It gives us that moment to see wholeness, to see beauty to see perfection for those that we care about and for ourselves. So if you're in a place where you have that vision, where your doorway has been cleaned, your perception is, is vast and infinite, and you know a truth about someone that they may not be experiencing at this time, or truth for yourself that you may not be realizing at this time, this is the moment to speak it out loud into the room and we'll take it into prayer together. So I offer you that opportunity right now. Rising from the silence is a consciousness of the divine. I'm simply knowing that God is in this place because we are in this place and God is everywhere present. And through our acceptance of that idea, we have now stepped into conscious union with spirit. So I know that the words that I speak right now are an opportunity for each and every person here to express more of God and to allow God to be more fully expressed by means of each and every one of us and each and every person that we hold in our hearts and our minds. I know that in this week where so many people are celebrating the passion story and moving through the meaning of what it means to step into the city triumphant, to be recognized for your glory and to have that question, then have to rise triumphant on the other side of it. That hero's journey of which we are all taking. I know right now in this time and in this place, by the words we have spoken and the intentions we hold in our heart, that we move those people in our minds through the process of that hero's journey. We move people to the resurrection of their, jo of their joy, of their happiness, of their fulfillment, of their wholeness. Be it showing up by right relationship, or perfect employment, or that right place for living, harmony, peaceful conversation, abundance and prosperity, moving away from lack. We know that the power of prayer brings that about. We know that a consciousness of the right action brings that about. And we speak a word of power and grace for our, our, our dear one, Joe Herser, who's uh, experiencing a health challenge right now. And we're so grateful to have Ola here back from her flu experience. We know that Joyce is moving through healing after her operation this week on her ears. And, and we, just, we just speak a word of, of well-being for all those that we love and we hold dear. So it is in this time and in this place that I know that the word spoken does not return unto any of us void, for it is made manifest by the intention within our hearts. And we allow that intention to flow into a law that always says yes, that always responds in the, in the affirmative, and then makes it real in our lives through time and space. That is the process. Feeling complete in the deep conviction of this truth, I release this prayer now to that law by saying, and so it is. So it is.